Am I good? Am I? Whoa, I'm on. This is very exciting. You can do this. Hurry, hurry. Yes. Okay. We're going we're gonna to do this. I can't see anything. It's just a sea of blackness. So hello, everybody. Um, wait a minute. Let me do it right. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Okay. My name is Dean, um, and I really uh, appreciate you being here. It's an honor to speak with you today. Uh, I come from the United States, uh, specifically South Carolina. Uh, I am the uh, owner and, and partner in a company called True Matter. And we are a UX company, so all we do all day, every day is user experience for complex digital products, which means I get to work with great developers all day, every day. Uh, and it's fantastic. And so it's a privilege and honor to speak with you today um, here at NDC Oslo. So we're going to have a little bit of fun today, do something a little bit different, uh, because it's amazing to me, and I'm a space nut, okay? And I don't know, I hope some of you are, but it's amazing to me that what happened in the space race 60 plus years ago can mean something to us today. Uh, and I love it anyway. Uh, I read stuff on this, I study it, I, I just dig it. Space nut. Uh, so we're going to learn a little bit about this and hopefully um, sort out something about how we work. In order to do that, we're going to go back in time a little bit to 1968, where we're going to start. And in 1968, uh, these two little step tortoises um, were part of the Soviet space program. And they are the first Earthlings to go around the moon and return back safely. Uh, so it's kind of a, a big deal, the first Earth creatures uh, to go around the moon. And they went around in this craft called the Zond 5. This is the, the, uh, the vehicle that did this. And it was a, a, an important achievement for the Soviet space program. Now, it did work, all right? They sent these tortoises all the way around the moon. But on the way back, they had all sorts of problems with the craft. And the problem was um, uh, going to affect reentry, going to affect where they ended up. So they ended up, instead of in Kazakhstan, they're going to splash down in the Indian Ocean. And the Americans, of course, are paying very close attention to this. And they think, hey, if we hurry, we could go get a look at this thing, splash down in the Indian Ocean. There it is. Before the Soviets pick it up. And so the Americans did, and this is the picture they took. And when they looked at this splashdown device, it confirmed to the Americans what they had suspected for a very, very long time now, that American technology was way ahead of Soviet technology by 1968. Uh, and they really started feeling, hey, I think we got this. I think we're going to get to the moon first. Uh, because we're doing, we're doing really great, and they just sent up this rock. Um, three months later, just three months later, in December of 1968, the United States sends three men around the moon and back in a flawless operation. So a couple of tortoises, and it messes up. Three months later, three astronauts go around, and the Americans are on their way to the moon. And so the question I ask is a simple one, and it's one of the first questions I asked myself when I started really getting into the space race. Like, why did it happen that way? Things don't have to go the way they did. There's a reason why things happened the way they do, and I want to know. The Soviet Union was first to nearly every important space milestone, but they didn't get to the most biggest prize, which is the moon. They didn't get there first. So, you know, what happened? Right? So that's the idea. So in order to do that, in order to understand how things went the way they did, um, we need to go back in time even a little bit more. So if you're a young person, uh, a millennial, Gen Y and Gen Z, this is like forever ago. We're going to go all the way back to World War II. Uh, and we're going to give you a history of the space race. So let's go back, um, end of World War II. The Soviet Union's coming in from the east. The Americans are coming in from the west, west, east, okay. 
uh, and they're uh, trying to finish off Nazi Germany. Now, they're also out to do something really important. They want to get a bunch of German technology and a bunch of German scientists. And they want to capture that technology and they want to capture the scientists. Because the Germans had been working on a bunch of really crazy great technology in terms of war. And one of them was the V2 rocket. So the Germans had built this rocket and they had fired it successfully uh, at England. And everyone looked at this rocket and said, man, that's where war is going. We need this technology because both the Soviet Union and the United States could see that they're going to be antagonists later and whoever has this technology is going to have the upper hand. Now, the Soviets end up getting a bunch of this technology. All right? Now, the, the United States got a bunch of the scientists because the scientists were like, maybe if we give up to the United States, we'll live. Right? Um, and uh, sort of that happened. But a bunch of the technology went to the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union gets a big boost. They have a, they have a big head start in rockets, and it was all military. Okay? Everyone's like, we've got to militarize uh, these rockets and use them for our purposes. And of course, World War II ends with nuclear missile, or nuclear bombs, rather. And uh, both sides are like, hey, wait, what if we put a nuclear warhead on the missile? Oh, now we really got it. All right, so this is where military technology goes. And by, like, I'd say the mid-50s, you know, we get this thing called the Cold War, which is where the uh, United States is essentially at war with the Soviet Union um, in every other way except actual war. Um, because they both have so many nuclear weapons by this point that each side could essentially obliterate the other. And we have this um, principle in place called MAD, which you may have heard of, Mutually Assured Destruction. Uh, if I uh, am the Soviet Union and I attack you, uh, the United States, I know that I'm going to be completely destroyed and vice versa. So we're not going to do that. No one wants to do that. But we're going to fight in every other way possible. Uh, and that's how the Cold War works out. And so the United States and Soviet Union, they're competing over everything. They're competing over, over territory. They're competing you know, with science. They're competing with athletics. They're competing with politics, with propaganda. Everything they could possibly compete over, they're competing over. Some of it very serious, some of it very marketing, right? Like that. And of course, space. Competition comes to uh, center in on space. And at first, the idea is, of course, militarization. All right? We are going to militarize space. And each side was concerned that the other side was going to militarize space first. And that was freaking everyone out. We cannot let the other side get the upper hand in the militarization of space. So all of these programs are created uh, to sort of uh, uh, create... Um, essentially a space program in each country. Um, now, the Soviets are doing really better at first because they've got more, better rocket technology uh, than the United States. So they, they are able to start and do more, both in terms of intercontinental ballistic missiles, which they innovate, uh, and in terms of the space race itself. So this is how we get the space race, and then there's a lot to this. I can only give you uh, a little bit today. We'll do the best we can. But of course, bum -bum, the moon becomes the big goal. At first, it's all about militarization. But it becomes about something more. It becomes uh, about what was thought of and described as sort of the pinnacle of technological human achievement. We're going to get someone to the moon, and sort of everyone knew this is what we're doing. And in order to do that, there's going to be a bunch of incremental steps to get there. And the Soviets, of course, they, they're first. Okay, now they get the first satellite up in space. This is Sputnik 1. This is 12, this is 1957, so this is 12 years after the end of World War II. And you're an American in the middle of America somewhere, and you're like, oh, oh my, there's there's a Soviet satellite above me right now. What is it? Is it listening? Is it spying? Is it a weapon? What? I don't know, but they were first. They're going to militarize space. They're going to dominate space. And it was, a, it was very disconcerting to Americans, uh, and it was a bit of a wake-up call for them. Um, now, the Soviets, though, 
<clears throat> they're blasting stuff off into space on this great rocket technology, and they do nearly everything first. Nearly everything. By nearly everything, I mean like nearly everything. Uh, this is all the stuff that the Soviets did first, and it's a lot. Uh, now, sometimes the Soviets would get to these first just before the Americans, sometimes significantly before, but it's all first. And to the American psyche, this is very damaging. You know, uh, oh, I thought we were going to be this this great force in the world, but yet here is the Soviet Union uh, dominating space. But we know that the United States caught up, right? I mean, we know our history. We know this happened. So that begs the question for me, you know, how did that occur? Uh, we know that in uh, 1962, this is going to be after uh, Yuri Gagarin in 1961, 1962, uh, the uh, president of the United States, John F. Kennedy at the time, he does this big speech that sort of motivates America. And he's like, Oh, we choose to go to the moon in this decade, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. You know, all this sort of stuff. And everyone gets really excited. And he says, we're going to do it this, in this decade. And everyone's like, well, okay, we're kind of behind right now by a lot. Uh, but the American space program really picks up at that point. And we know, da-da, 1969, right? Humans get to the moon. And we see that the flag is an American flag, not a Soviet flag. So this begs the question to me again, you know, why did that go that way? But I also asked another question to myself because, you know, I make, like you, like I make digital products, software, sites, apps, all day, every day. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's all about technology and making. And when I look at the Soviet space race, I see technology and making, and I start seeing similarities between what I see engineers doing uh, in the space race and sort of what we do every day. And I, I start wondering, well, if they're similar, how are they similar and why? And so I start thinking, well, it's all about engineering. It's all about technology. It's got like a design component, right? It's got like uh, uh, the ability to create new things. We're, we're trying to move fast. We're trying to use new technology. Technology is changing rapidly. It's hard to keep up. Uh, we are um, set in a, in a wide context. For the space race, it's geopolitics. Uh, uh, for what we do with digital products, it's the, the, the overarching market. Uh, these um, things that we do with the internet sort of burst onto the scene. Uh, it, it captured the entire economy, just sort of like the space race did. In fact, what we do kind of came from the technology push of the space race in the first place. So I'm seeing all this, all this similarity, and some of the similarities I see don't make me feel very good. <laughs> they, um, they're a little disconcerting to me. So what we're going to do is look at just a few stories uh, from the space race that, that, for me, illustrate how they're the same. Uh, how they um, how they remind me of what I do, of what we do. Uh, so we're going to start, and we're going to look at a bunch of really interesting images. All these images are from Soviet propaganda, uh, and uh, this was, you know, we were. This is from a poster. We were born to make the fairy tale come true. So the first point I want to make is about speed, which was the hallmark of the Soviet model, speed, okay? So the Soviets cared deeply about going fast. It, everything was about speed for them. In order to do things first, uh, they had to cut corners to do things, to do things first. Uh, they, um, they bulldogged everything. They bootstrapped everything. They, they circumvented uh, safety. They would do things without testing at all. Just do it. Uh, um, how many people were potentially you know, hurt or killed in, in either space program, particularly the Soviet? We don't really know. They were secretive about it. Chances are more than we think. Um, to illustrate this, I'll give you one story of the first spacewalk. OK, this is in 1965. Uh, and this is Alexei Leonov, an amazing dude. This is a real picture of him really walking out in space. First outside of vehicle um, situation. Now, 
in order to do this, the Soviet Union, they're like, we are going to be first at this. We are going to have someone walk outside of a space vehicle first no matter what. So what they did was they took this rocket they had been working on called the Voshkod, Voshkod 1, and, th and they turned it into this thing called the Voshkod 2. Uh, and this was a refitting of the Voshkod 1 for the express purpose of walking outside the capsule. That's it. That's all we're doing. We're going to go up there. We're going to walk outside. And in order to do that, they had, and this is the vehicle, the Voshkod 2, they had to retrofit the vehicle in some pretty radical ways. For instance, um, in order to fit everything in the capsule so you can end up going outside, they had to get rid of everything that would prevent a cosmonaut from dying, uh, basically. Uh, ejection seat, gone. Uh, you can't escape when you're uh, coming home or when you're going out. I mean, this is it. Either you're going to go up there and you're going to walk outside this thing, uh, Alexei, or uh, you're probably not coming back. All right, this is basically the idea. Um, and they're pushing the schedule. Uh, they didn't test any of this stuff, of course. And the, um, I should say that the, the Voshka 2 was still run on, on vacuum tubes, right? So it's pressurized capsules. So you can't just like open the door and go outside. Like, uh, what do we do? So like, they had this great idea, and I can imagine the engineers in the room, I got it. What if we just make an inflatable airlock and just attach it? And someone said, yes, yes. Uh, and they totally did it. Uh, and uh, so you see that sort of on the bottom there, this big sort of thing they had to inflate, on, and then, and then uh, uh, Alexei's got to kind of go out of there, right? Now, of course, uh, Alexei, um, there he is. Uh, and by the way, he's so amazing. Okay, spoilers, he lived. Um, He's so amazing, he did this spacewalk and whatnot, and then he came home and painted himself doing it. So this is his own painting. Uh, he's, he's sort of better than us. Okay. All right. Um, so anyway, he gets in this space suit, right? This space suit that he had never worn before, experimental space suit, of course, uh, untested. And um, he, they, they do this whole thing. They go up there, and he gets out, and as soon as he gets out into space, things go wrong. Okay, he's out there for 12 minutes total, and the whole time, everyone's freaking out. He's freaking out, sort of ground control's freaking out, get inside, get inside, get inside. And he's like, well, I can't because my spacesuit is blowing up, uh, and uh, now I can't get inside. Uh, so Alexei, he's a pretty amazing guy, so he says, I know, I know, I'm just going to vent the oxygen. So he vents the oxygen out of his suit to a very dangerous level, it gives him decompression sickness, uh, and he's freaking out, you've got to get inside right now. All right, uh, they're yelling at him. He's like, okay, okay, okay. And so he goes inside the wrong way. All right, there's only one way to go into that airlock, and his feet first. He goes in head first because he's not thinking and he's freaking out. So now he's inside that thing, and he's got to turn around inside an inflatable airlock that is not meant for anyone to turn around in. Meanwhile, his heart rate's skyrocketing. He's sweating so much, he fills his boots with sweat to overflowing. That's pretty stressed out. Anyway, he gets in. He does it. He, he gets in in just enough time. Uh, and they're able to, to start reentry. And then they had um, a few more problems. Um, oxygen spikes to like 45% or something inside the capsule caused a lot of problems for the crew. Um, there was reentry problems. Uh, they ended up crashing in the Ural Mountains, which is nowhere near where they were supposed to go, and they had to stay out there for two nights in freezing cold temperatures in the mountains waiting for rescue. And that's the story of the first spacewalk. Now, it's basically a miracle uh, that Leonov didn't die. Uh, it's unbelievable, and you should totally Google it, because I only gave you a little bit of it. After this, they totally scrapped the Voshkod program, saying it was, it was not safe, it was too risky. And this is the Soviets saying that, okay? Which is like, it really means something when they say, we can't do that, all right? Okay, now, now, here's where I start getting freaked out about us. Because I make a lot of digital products, you make a lot of digital products, and before you say, hey, Dean, don't, don't compare us to that. Well, I don't know about you, but as an industry, I think we're not really known for shipping stuff that's bug-free. We're not known for shipping things without problems. 
we're not known for shipping software and products that has awesome user experience, right? Mostly uh, it's full of bugs, mostly user experience is bad. And I've been doing this with companies my whole career, and I can say this is basically true. Uh, and we seem to expect it. We expect things to be bad so much that we gave it a name. We expect things to ship with problems, we expect it to ship with bad experiences, and we just call it MVP. And someone had this great, you know, great marketing idea, I think, to say, no, 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 it's a minimum viable product. Um, now, I, I do understand what a minimum viable product is, of course. Uh, and I actually love the idea. It's kind of a perfect idea of evolution, right? Uh, sort of like survival of the product that fits best right now. We've got to ship. I mean, otherwise, we're doing nothing. Uh, and I understand where we came from. You know, software bloat, huge timelines, skyrocketing costs, never shipping. Got to do something, right? Uh, so I recognize that. But the pendulum for me sort of swings both ways. Um, and we have to ask ourselves some, some rather difficult questions because what, are we, what have we given up for the desire to go first? This is a question that I think the Soviets could have asked themselves. They were probably okay with what they did. But you know, what have we given up for going first? Uh, and I would say we are giving up quality. Uh, we are giving up long-term viability because in my, in my experience, I don't know if this is true for you, but in my experience working with people and companies that make these products, they, they drive for this thing, go first, go first, hurry, got a ship, don't worry, it's MVP, we're going to make it better, we're totally going to evolve it, it's going to be amazing, we're just going to keep making it better. And then they abandon it and go on to the next MVP. That's basically what they do. And that MVP product just sort of sits there and doesn't get better and hardly ever is improved. And I think that's more common than we would like to admit. So we're basically squandering the MVP promise of that grand evolution because we're not doing it as a rule, or at least I don't see it happening uh, the way I would like to see it happen. So what should we do? Uh, in my view, um, the idea is to redefine minimal, okay? The idea is to say, you know, we, we actually should care about quality and let's define quality as low as we can, right? Let's say, I just want way fewer bugs and a stronger user experience. How about just that, okay, as a, a redefinition of what a minimally accepted product is? That's, that's fair, right? That sounds doable to me. Um, and because quality, and I, I'm, I'm defining, you know, I'm a UX guy, so I'm, I'm defining a, a, a user's experience, productivity, efficiency, satisfaction, all that stuff, as a mark of quality. Quality does win, and here's how I know. This is the Gemini 4, all right? And this is Ed White. He's the first American in space to do a spacewalk outside of a vehicle. This happened just three months, just three months after Alexei Leonov nearly died trying it. And Ed White, he's out in space for 20 minutes. He's sort of lollygagging in space, having a good time, taking movies, taking pictures. Ground control's yelling at him to come in because he's staying out there too long, not because they're freaking out that he's going to die. They're like, hey, come on, man, Ed, let's go. We got, you got to go in, all right? And so they finally have to order him to go in. And of course, he just opens the door and goes in, you know? And uh, as he's about to close the door, he says uh, over, his, uh, over his radio, he says, this is the saddest moment of my life because he had to go inside and he had to close the door on that that spectacle. That is an entirely different story from Leonov. Yes, Alexei was first. He wins. But Ed was better. And the Gemini technology was superior in every way to the Voskhod 2 uh, in terms of its advances, in terms of its, um, in terms of its base technology, in terms of its safety. Three months. Three months is like, is like that. It's like a snap. It's nothing. Right? So for me, the deliberate pace is the real winner. And it wasn't even that much longer, just a little bit. Sometimes just a little bit of time gets you a ton more quality. OK, let's keep going. Uh, this is another bit of propaganda through the worlds and ages. Um, 
I want to talk to you about something called the Korolev effect. And I want you to meet a really interesting dude. Uh, this is the chief architect. Uh, this is the head designer. This is the integral, if you've read Tom Wolfe. This is Sergei Korolev. Uh, this guy was in the Red Army, a uh, scientist. And like all the other scientists, Stalin distrusted him and threw them all in the gulag uh, to rot and die. But Korolev they let out because Korolev knew rockets, and rockets were important. So he gets to come out because he's the rocket man, and he's going to take care of building this militarized rocket program. They love this guy, all right? They lionize this guy. He's as close as you get to a saint uh, in the Soviet system. And he's the guy who says, all right, all right, you know, rockets are important. You know, it's military stuff. This is great. We're going to dominate the Americans, blah, blah, blah. But you know, what we really should do is go into space first just because we'll just stick it to the Americans by doing it. And he convinces Khrushchev that space is good just for propaganda, just for just rubbing in the Americans' face. And if we can go faster and we can do it first, we'll proclaim the greatness of our system over Americans. And Khrushchev's like, oh, that's good, yeah, right? And, and that's, how, uh, that's how rather Korolev gets to, gets to do the space program. Really, Korolev just wanted to go to space. He just was like, he was a space nut. He wanted this. And so he convinces the Soviet system to let him do it, right? And so they do that. Um, and Korolev is proof to me uh, that one person can make a huge difference, all right? This is all the stuff that Korolev did for the Soviet space program. It's basically everything, all right? Nothing happened without this guy. Uh, he's planning it, he's designing it, he's project managing it, he's taking care of it, he's approving it, uh, everything. He's doing the strategy, he's doing the reporting. Um, if not for him, this stuff doesn't happen. And they love him for it. They make coins to this guy, right? But I'd like you to look closely at this coin and look closely at the date. 1966, height of the space race, Korolev dies. Uh, he dies rather suddenly. Um, and now the Soviet space program is in complete disarray without him. He was so central to the effort. Um, and the system was so organized around his superstardom uh, that it sort of went to hell uh, when he died. You had all these other people vying to be the next Korolev only none of them were as good as Korolev. Uh, and in order to show the leadership that they were the best, they're like, we're going to do something awesome. We're going to do something great. Uh, and so they became even more reckless than before, which again, for the Soviets, is kind of saying something. All right? Uh, so the very next... Um, well, let me, let, me, let me go back a minute uh, before I tell you what happened. So we see the flaw there, obviously. Um, if one person is in that much control, you're kind of screwed. Uh, and we're going to come back to that in a minute. The, uh, the very next mission without Korolev in control was Soyuz 1. Uh, and Soyuz 1 goes up. Uh, Vladimir Komarov, I believe, was the cosmonaut. And they were first again uh, at something, only this time it was the first in-flight fatality. Uh, Komarov was said to have died from blunt force trauma, which means crashed. Um, and here's Komarov. Uh, the Soyuz 1 launch had no fewer than 200 reported problems by the engineers and designers that were left unfixed. They're going to launch anyway. And it was a spectacular failure. Uh, so, now, let's talk about that fundamental flaw again. Uh, because for me, I'm thinking about what we do again, right? And I'm thinking, I'm a little freaked out by this because I've worked with a lot of teams over my time. Um, and superstars in development teams, they, they can be pretty dominant, right? 
Um, so let's say you've got someone on your team. Let's say they're architect or developer or whatever. And let's say they are amazing and they are central and they are quasi-superstar. You, you tend to end up depending on them, right? You depend on them for their superstar status because they're good. You just end up depending on people who are good, right? Um, you depend on how much they know. Uh, and when they're gone, and go they do, they take a lot with them. They take technological knowledge with them. They take innovation knowledge with them. They take plans with them. Uh, they take domain knowledge with them. And you're left with, ah, and, and now a team is trying to fill their shoes and doesn't do as well. This happens a lot. And superstar people move around uh, because they can. And you're kind of dependent on how hard they work or how much they care or uh, how, how long they work. Uh, in order to get something done. And you've probably had people on your team like this. It leaves development teams super vulnerable, right? So what if this person has bad motivations? Uh, what, if, um, what if we're relying on a person so much that we don't cultivate a decent process uh, and that we, we can't do without them? Uh, what if the person who is the most important isn't a developer? What if they're like a a really overbearing stakeholder or um, a, a really politically intent product lead, right? They could, they could careen a project into disaster all by themselves, all by themselves without, without much help. So our job is easy to say, hard to do, uh, which is if you're that superstar or if you're that lead, you're trying to create something that outlives you. That's just a principle. Um, if you go into a situation with a team thinking, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to bulldog this, I'm not going to bootstrap this, I'm going to create something that lasts, uh, just process-wise, it'll change the way you work. And you can demand that of developers as well. Um, I'm here to say a, a team itself should be redefined. And I'm not going to go into this too much other than to say we still maintain, a, well, to use a missile metaphor, silos, right? Um, uh, development teams are, are usually composed a certain way because it's all we know. Uh, and we don't tend to have uh, certain disciplines associated. So I'm going to, I'll raise my hand and say it's rare uh, that a strong design UX professional is, is uh, uh, co-leading a team, all right? That's a very rare thing. Uh, but when uh, a strong UX lead and a powerful architect developer work together, magic. You can create great things together, uh, especially if they're working together uh, on each other's stuff and collaboratively. And this is the sort of the polar opposite of the one dominant player who, who drives things. So I see that a lot. And when I learned a little bit about Korolev, I was like, oh, gone. That's like half the projects I've ever seen are like that. Now, you might say, what am I supposed to do about it? Like, I'm a developer, I can't, like, they don't even let me see the users, you know, for crying out loud. Well, I can tell you this. Many of the great processes I've seen uh, that happen in teams um, come from young developers, some who are just a year or so into their careers, and they just try something, and they push a process, and they get it out there, and and it didn't come from, you know, leaders or didn't come from uh, uh, more seasoned people. Sometimes it just comes from the bottom up. Uh, you'd be surprised how often you can influence a team just in that way. I mean, if, uh, if some, you know, 22 or 23-year-old person can just say, I'm going to try this and not have fear and um, instill a new process or try a new technology, they're having influence over the team, um, you can have influence. Uh, you only don't have influence when you think you don't. Uh, now, you may try and it might not work, uh, but the wor it's worth your try. Okay, a little bit more. Um, the Soviets were really good at propaganda. I mean, really amazing at it. You're looking at um, another one of these wonderful images. Um, I think this is something like the Soviet space program is a hymn to the Soviet people. 
Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about Pravda. Now, Pravda was the, um, the newspaper, right? the Soviet state newspaper, and this was the masthead. And Pravda just means truth. Uh, and you know, if your newspaper is called Truth, eh, you should probably be skeptical. Right? Um, so let's look at the Zon 5 to look at, to look at what propaganda really is. Because you know, propaganda is saying something amazing about something that might mean nothing. So, you know, Step Turtis's on 5, 1968, we're very excited, right? Um, well, they made lots of these wonderful posters and, and lots of these pronouncements and proclamations and, and, uh, and a stamp, for crying out loud, uh, for the Zon 5, the glorious victory of the Zon 5. I'd like you to look at the date this stamp was released, 1969. Anyone have any idea what else was happening in 1969 that was somewhat more important than tortoises? Um, yeah, that was when humans were walking on the moon. This is my good side right here. You has got that? Do you want to try that? We got it? Yes, okay, good. There's a photographer down here, okay. All right. Um, right, so Americans walking on the moon. Hey, we did great with the tortoises, right? That's propaganda. Now, Space Pravda, space propaganda. The Soviets were amazing at this, okay? I mean, the stuff they created was beautiful, phenomenal, omnipresent, everywhere. It was massive murals, it's posters, it's stuff they send people, it's they print it for people, and it's all about the greatness of the Soviet system. It's all about the immense power and importance of what is happening with the program itself. And it's saying something bigger. It's saying our system is better. Our people are better. Um, it's saying, look at there's glory to the cosmonauts, right? Glory to the first woman in space. Uh, and to give you uh, an idea about that, uh, every time you look into something just a little bit, you realize it's not quite as high highfalutin as all that, right? Uh, the Soviets put a woman in space first, because they cared about equality, that's true. And they cared about uh, you know, everyone being the same, also true. And Korolev heard that the Americans were gonna put some women in space, so he's like, uh, uh, and, and launched someone fast. Of course, he was wrong, his, his intelligence was incorrect. America wasn't doing that, uh, and, and that's how that happened so fast. Um, propaganda, the people themselves are going into space, right? The kids are growing up, yearning to be a part of what greatness the Soviet people will be all about. Meanwhile, you know, we know, you know, we make things, we know it's sort of fumbling and messy and barely there, and I sure hope these tortoises live, right? But this is what's happening out there. And, you know, kitties and Christmas and all that sort of stuff, right? Okay. So propaganda, as we know, has a purpose. Uh, what you're trying to do is you're trying to manipulate and motivate uh, a population to stay committed to the thing you want them to stay committed to. Right? And, and these are uh, larger philosophical ideas that the Soviets want to focus on. Uh, and they're also trying to drive reality by, by force of will. They're trying to use this propaganda to make reality different, just just because people will be more committed and more interested, uh, and maybe, um, maybe the demoralization of your enemy in and of itself is valuable, right? So the, um, the things that the Soviets would say about all the stuff they were doing, it kind of maybe sort of related to what really happened. You know, it was, it was you know, yeah, we were first, you know, um, but not necessarily uh, telling the whole story. Um, all these timelines that the Soviets did, they launched stuff, they launched stuff because it was Lenin's birthday. That's why. They launched stuff because this date would be really embarrassing to the Americans. Uh, they launched stuff because, OMG, the Americans are gonna do it next week. We gotta do it right now. You know, I'm, I'm being, um, Exaggerating for effect, right? But that's basically what they did. Uh, so all those dates is completely artificial. You think you have artificial timelines, right? Um, it's all about reinforcing the system itself. 
And everything is politics. Everything is politics first. So then I start thinking, yikes. Kind of sounds like my company. Um, before you think that, you know, just countries do this, like companies do this. Companies that, um, that I've worked with are very like this. Uh, and, and they're like this more than not. So artificial timelines, you know, our competitor is putting something out, so we have to. We have to do it earlier. We have to do it on this date for this reason. Um, uh, that reason has nothing to do with what the development team said. Uh, of course, uh, and maybe maybe we're going to launch a product because we have to secure a deal or we have to get the sale or we have to make those investors happy or look, we're going to talk about we just added this little itty bitty, itty bitty feature and boy, is it world beating and going to change your life. Um, we'll just make promises about what this thing is going to do. It doesn't do it, but we'll just say it does and let the development team figure out the rest, right? And, and this happens all the time, uh, which is why there's probably no salespeople here, so we can, you know, we could talk about them and make fun of them, right? Okay, but it happens to us all the time. I mean, I feel like we kind of live in a world of propaganda, so all this stuff is, you know, reminding me uncomfortably of what I learned from the space race. So, all right, let's pause for a second and think about a couple of lessons before we're done. Um, okay. Your philosophy of development, of your team, of how you want to do the space race really matters, okay? Your starting point matters. The way you think about something affects what you do. Uh, it affects the results you get. So, Soviets, we are going to be first no matter what. ba ba we did it. You know, if you want to be first, you're just going to have to sacrifice a whole lot of stuff to be first. Fine. You can do that. If you want to say, all right, we might not be first, but we're going to be really, really, really good. You can do that too, right? It's a different philosophy. It's a different approach. It's going to yield different results. Uh, and so our job really is to think about how we can keep the good and jettison the bad. Uh, and easier said than done, I think. Uh, but let's see what we can do. So, one of the problems with going first, one of the things you sacrifice more than anything, and as, as like development teams, like we, we, we don't need to be told this, right? I feel like, you know, I should give this talk to the, to the sales teams and product leads, um, right? We don't need to be told that if you go really fast, really, 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 really fast and really first, man, are you going to pay for that later? You're going to pay for it in quality. You're going to pay for it in problems. We're going to have to redo all this stuff. And in the end, you're going to end up going slower than you thought you were going to go because you wanted to go fast, fast in the beginning. This totally happened to the Soviets. Uh, their model was essentially unsustainable. They could run hot and fast for a short time. But as soon as they encountered problems, which they did, more than just Korolev dying, uh, it, it just absolutely smashed their program. Whereas the Americans just had a different approach. We're, gonna, we're not going to worry. We want to be first. We really want it. But we're not going to sacrifice these few things in order to get there. We're not going to sacrifice safety. Uh, I mean, it's all relative. This was the space race. Uh, technology and things like that. All right? So the, the United States was slower at first, kind of like a locomotive. But as soon as they got churning with a stronger, more deliberative process, by the time they started really moving, then they started going really fast. And by the time you're hitting the uh, end of the 60s, the Americans are going so much faster than the Soviets that it's, it's, not, even, it's not even a comparison. At the, at the time, we didn't really know just how much, just how much better we were. Uh, by the end of the 60s, but it was a lot. Uh, so it's just a different philosophy, a different result. If you go slow, you can go fast. Deliberate does win. Um, and that means we're investing in quality, and that's baseline quality. Remember, I just gave you a low bar for quality. A lot fewer bugs, better user experience. Can we just, can we just start there and not worry about perfection? Um, we're going we're gonna to be able to make better things. Um, building to last means process. It means quality. Uh, it means thinking of the future. Uh, it's easier to do that when you're not sacrificing everything to go absolutely first. 
uh, it's easier to sit back and, and make it right. So we count, by the way, we counsel companies to do this all the time. Uh, and because companies always want to hurry and they hire us and they're like, hey, we want to do this thing. And, uh, and they always say, it's this big, imagine this big complex thing someone just asked you to do. It's big, it's complex, it's world being, it's going to change us and our industry. Let's see, it's June, we would like this in August. And I'm like, August, this meeting's going to take till August. And so we basically counsel them, listen, we're going to go a little slower than you want at first. But man, we're going to define a great experience and a great way to, to last. And all the companies that come with us when we do that, um, they end up doing great. Uh, by and large, they end up killing it. But the companies that end up saying, no, thank you for that counsel, but we got to go, go, go. Invariably, I, I just see them having to redo everything or just live with crap, just terrible stuff. And by the time, you know, the implications of their bad software come to fruition, the people that made the decisions are gone. They're somewhere else. They're not even in the company anymore. Uh, so it's a choice. Okay. Uh, and I think good products can do a lot of the talking on their own. I, I'm, you know, marketing is fabulously important. I'm not talking about good, solid, excellent marketing. Uh, I'm talking about saying things that are wildly exaggerated and untrue and, uh, and driving through propaganda. Like, good products do the talking. It's really easy to market a great product. It really is. Uh, it's, it's really hard, it's really hard to market a bad one. Uh, so, if we're making something with a product speaking, we got it. Okay. Now, do you think it's hard to make great products really fast and still be good? I do. I think it's hard. It's not impossible, though, because NASA. So NASA did it. They, 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 they put a human being on the moon, uh, and they ended, up, they ended up at the end just crushing the Soviets in terms of speed and quality uh, in those last couple of years. It was crazy. When I mean, we looked at the Zon 5, we were like, oh, man, we're killing these guys. You know, we were paranoid about it. But we sort of figured it out. And, and these folks, man, they were, they were working under time pressure, OK? Just because it wasn't Soviet time pressure doesn't mean it wasn't time pressure. They were working hard. Uh, they were working ridiculously long hours. They're having to invent things along the way. They're inventing processes. They're solving novel problems. I assure you, they were doing stuff way harder than any of the stuff we're doing right now. Uh, and yet, they, they did. They, they did it. Uh, and I, I submit that it was a lot of their style uh, that helped them succeed. Uh, they, they, they weren't going to fall a trap to uh, the Soviet speed method. And it worked for them. And it, it wasn't impossible. It was just not normal. That's all. It was just not normal. So I think if we just aim for not normal, we're great. Because not normal wins, right? Um, and I want to encourage you, just like I, I mentioned earlier, that you have more influence than you think. If you care about this stuff and you're on a team, you're probably doing better than you think you are. Uh, keep trying uh, to push these things. You'd be surprised at what you can accomplish. Uh, we look at the Americans. I mean, as late as, as 1968, freaking out and sweating. We're not going to do this, man. They're going to beat us, man. And then we look at the Zon 5, and we're like, ah, oh, come on. All right, let's just go win, right? Uh, it was, it, it, we suspected things were going better, but when we started seeing the proof, we're like, wow, we've been, we've been doing well for years, uh, and, and we didn't see just how well uh, we were doing. Because again, the Soviet's super secretive and all that. Okay. That's what the Soviet space program taught me about digital product development. Um, I'm super honored that you listened. I am happy to answer whatever questions you want. This is me. Uh, find me anywhere. Um, I will talk space with you all day if you want to, um, which includes right now and includes out in the hallway uh, or later. So thanks very much for listening. I do appreciate it. And I guess I'll hang out if you have any, any questions. Thank you.